Hi everybody, I'm Rick Farina uh, again. Uh, yesterday I did some fun stuff on stage, but I didn't really explain a lot of hows and whys. I just kind of showed off what, what can be done so that people can, be, people can be terrified and not really sleep. And it's, it's a lot of fun to do that kind of thing, but I think that it's really important to have some understanding. So uh, in this talk, I'm gonna actually reprise a previous talk and cover some stuff that uh, kind of explains how a lot of these Wi-Fi attacks are really possible, what hackers are actually doing right now, and maybe for those of you that do you know, public venues and things like that, this will be an interesting bit, things to think about, possibly things that you guys can help solve that I couldn't solve either. So with that said, we'll uh, go right into it. Uh, again, I'm Rick, I do a lot of stuff, I have a lot of fun, and that's about enough of that garbage. Um, Today we're talking about what hackers do. This is what hackers look like. Clearly I'm not a real hacker. My beard doesn't come to that quite nice point. I'm working on it, but it's, it's been a, a really rough winter for shaving. Uh, so Wi-Fi is kind of an exception to the generally accepted rules of networking. Uh, networking is typically something that's brought about in the enterprise, and it very slowly trickles down over the years into the homes. Whereas Wi-Fi is something that's been entirely consumer driven uh, not really a lot of forethought for security and things like that, so it kind of circumvents almost everything. You used to have that nice hard perimeter and nothing could get in and out, and then they just kind of create thousands of Wi-Fi access points that give you that in and out of the network completely bypassing the firewall and all those kinds of things. So it's, it's a very unique technology in that nobody actually thought about all this stuff when they should have been thinking about it because uh, corporations and whatnot never used it. It was the consumers that are screaming, I want Wi-Fi, I want Wi-Fi. The businesses were all saying, oh God, no. Uh, <clears throat> so sometimes we learn the hard way that Wi-Fi is not a great idea. It's not very well thought out. It's not very well secured. And it's, it's definitely not very well secured. Uh, this is old stuff. You can pick your latest from the headlines. People get hacked all the time. A lot of it's wireless. And the reason is, is because why would you go through the vault door when you could just walk in the front door and take everything. It's, it's so easy to do Wi-Fi attacks on open networks or poorly secured networks that there's, there's no sense in trying something harder, to be quite honest. Uh, the two things that I saw <clears throat> in my eight years as a sales engineer that were people's views of Wi-Fi security, they either had one of two views. And they, they never had the right view. It was always, well, this doesn't apply to me. I don't have Wi-Fi. Who here has been to a place where they actually don't have Wi-Fi? I spent eight years servicing the US federal government specifically to make sure there was no Wi-Fi and not once did I walk into a facility that the entire time I was there, somebody's Wi-Fi device didn't show up. Not including myself, some other random putts, normally with an iPhone in the server room with the hotspot turned on because well, dude, I needed to download this patch and my phone's so much faster than the network here. I figured it was, you know. Literally, I've never seen it. I've seen facilities buried in bunkers that they still had Wi-Fi in there. Uh, it's, it's a thing. Uh, the other thing people say is, well, you know, I've got my access point secured. I have a firewall. I have an antivirus. I'm good to go. No problems here. Everything's secured. All of my authorized equipment is perfectly configured. Well, let's assume for just a second that you actually do live in that fantasy world where all of your stuff is properly configured. There's still a bunch of problems with that idea, and that's what we're going to be abusing today. So a view from the hacker's windshield, according to my marketing department, is that uh, you know, you're driving down the street and things just kind of pop up on the screen. I'm still waiting for somebody to make me one of these, by the way. If you've ever seen those little laser projectors that can actually, like, you know, they're starting to do heads-up displays in cars now, so if anybody wants to help me work on this, it would be awesome, and no, Google Glass does not count. Uh, so Wi-Fi hacking techniques, what do people actually do? Uh, we're gonna cover planting rogue access points, why phishing, uh, client misassociation attacks, and then denial of service, and then we'll jump into hopefully something reasonably funny for a demo. Uh, 10 common Wi-Fi threats, uh, this is stolen from Airtight's product, but I, I really love this one. Uh, it just talks about the general threats and what applies to Wi-Fi versus no Wi-Fi environments, right? You could have no wireless, but if somebody can walk into your building and plug a wireless access point in, you still have to worry about rogue access points, clients connecting to things they shouldn't connect to, these kinds of things. You can have a no wireless shop, 
But if you're in the middle of downtown Manhattan and every device that every one of your employees has has a Wi-Fi card in it, how exactly are you a no Wi-Fi shop? So I live in Pittsburgh, there's municipal Wi-Fi, and I was at a customer site downtown, and they told me they were in no Wi-Fi environment. I said, oh, that's interesting. So your employees have a cell phone, right? Right, they have a company-issued Blackberry. Does it have Wi-Fi on it? Oh, of course it does. What about all your laptops? Oh, they're Dells, yeah, latest wireless technology, but there's no, there's no APs here, so there's, this is a no wireless environment. So everybody's plugged into the wire, and then they're using their wireless card to connect to the city's network. Yeah, that's, that's no wireless for you. Yeah. Uh, so rogue APs, authorized APs, uh, I'm sorry, unauthorized APs connected to a monitored wired network. Uh, again, I'm using Airtight's terminology just because I, I like it the best. Um, these are devices that are typically not brought in by hackers. Uh, reason for that is, is why on earth would I break into your building and try to plant a rogue access point? Uh, I've, I've polled a lot of people that I talk to just for the fun of it. Uh, so far I've had exactly one person tell me that once in their career they found a maliciously planted rogue access point where a hacker actually did break into the building, climb up on a ladder, plant an access point over the ceiling, and leave it there. In reality, this kind of thing just doesn't happen from the hackers, it happens from your employees. And it happens a thousand times more often because nobody thinks about how bad this is for the network. They think, oh sweet, I got the new iPad 7. Oh, but the guy at Best Buy told me that this would definitely work way better if I get the Apple Extreme access point, right? Apple works better with Apple, so I'll just buy this, I'll plug it in my desk, IT doesn't even have to know. Hey, look, it just magically connected, everything's great, right? Don't worry about encryption, authentication, any of that stuff. I mean, it, it'll work better that way, right? Encryption just slows you down, honestly. But that's the problem, right? Is people don't understand these problems and they don't think about what they're doing and they cause an awful lot of harm that way. It, it's typically not intentional, but it, it happens quite a bit. Uh, so access point technology, you used to be looking for like a Linksys box, you know, the blue and black ones with the two cute antennas. And now you're looking for all kinds of stuff, right? Wi-Fi access points can be in little USB form factors. Uh, the one on the far right, the D-Link is powered by USB. Uh, the one on the far left is just a USB stick that looks like a large thumb drive. They can actually run a hotspot just by plugging it into the laptop and it's got a full screen on it and the whole nine yards. You can configure it right from there. It's, it's, it's a pretty cool toy. And then uh, my, my personal favorite, the uh, three com wall jack duo, uh, they made these things that they actually look like friggin' uh, RJ45 faceplates, but they're a little bit bigger in the back and they've got an access point built into them and the antennas in the front. So I mean, when you're looking for this stuff, it definitely has gotten a lot harder over the years to, to scape out where these devices are. Uh, so really the issue is, is which, which of the threats are genuine, right? Most people do like PCI style uh, scans of their networks and that means that a guy walks in, turns on his laptop, looks at the available networks and says, hmm, none of these say hacking my company so we must be clean, right? You know, you look and you say, okay, I work for Matisse and uh, nobody says hacking Matisse so we're good. Yeah, no, that, that, yeah, I mean, Linksys G, that's probably not me. Uh, Google Wi Fi, I'm sure that's totally legit. I mean, never mind the fact that we're in Oregon, don't worry about that. No, I'm sure Google just wanted Wi Fi there. You know, so you look at these things and you say, okay, what really is a threat to my network? And then people will go based on high signal strength or low signal strength or a different SSID and they'll be chasing ghosts for basically ever because there isn't a good way to do it like this at all. And that's where the users start to fall. Uh, users are completely unaware of what they're doing all of the time, all of the time. There's basically no exceptions. Uh, those of you who think you have educated users, they might be educated users compared to other users, but compared to people that actually have any clue, they're probably still pretty far down there. Uh, did a survey at Airtight. Basically, uh, all of our guys were on the road, so we had a whole bunch of guys scanning at airports, just looking to see what was going on with the wireless traffic. We were specifically interested with what the clients were doing, and we found that 56% were probing by name for one or more different access points, and we'll get to why that's ugly in just a minute. 
34% were willing to connect to what Airtight was classifying as highly insecure networks. That was known hotspots, default SSIDs, all unencrypted stuff. But that's just the known ones. The 56% was somebody's probing for something, which typically means they're, they're vulnerable enough. Uh, and then 13% were found probing for free public Wi-Fi. Yeah, free public Wi-Fi. Nice. Gotta love that one. What do you get when you connect to free public Wi-Fi? Anybody? <laughs> STDs. I heard that from the crowd. Very good. Yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, if you connect to free public Wi-Fi, it's an ad hoc network, so you connect to another user. What happens is, is when you connect, it adds it to your preferred network list, and ad hocs are connected to by beaconing out and saying, I'm an ad hoc, does anybody want to join me? So it kind of virally, organically grows based on user stupidity. As people keep clicking on this, it exponentially expands. So over the years, we've actually found it seems to stay fairly constant around 10 to 13% because people will decommission old devices, get new devices that aren't horribly infected yet. Uh, apparently, I learned yesterday uh, that uh, since Apple syncs everything, you can actually keep that going from one device to another through your cloud account, which is really great. So thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, ad hoc connection's bad just in general. Uh, there's, there's no reason to ever make an ad hoc connection, ever, 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 ever. We good there? OK, great. Uh, so what do we do now? We know that the users are probing for stuff that they probably shouldn't be probing for. We know they're willing to connect to stuff that they probably shouldn't connect to. So what do we do? Let's make ourselves a hotspot. So here's a picture of me at the hotel pool here. It's a lovely day. Just going to sit down, run a little access point, present a login, accept a username and password, maybe a credit card. You wanted that premium access, right? All right, $9.99, no problems. So welcome to the hotspot, right? Which hotspot are you connected to? Well, the, the SSID says Hyatt, right? So we're good. You know, the, the splash page says Hyatt. Uh, the, the, the credit card form's dead on. How do you know if you should be reaching for your credit card or not? Anybody? HTTPS in the browser. And what does HTTPS secure? It secures your connection to the server. If you're on my splash page, connected to my server, can I encrypt it? I absolutely can. Can I go to VeriSign and buy a certificate for I'm probably not hacking you.com and use that as my splash page? Absolutely I can. So what I will do is I will make sure that my HTTPS is perfectly signed, perfectly secured, up to the latest specs and standards to ensure that when you transmit your credit card to me, it is not stolen by anybody else. <laughs> Very important. Very important because honestly, it's a lot of work to do this, right? And credit cards are only worth like 25 cents each on the market. So seriously, you got you to gotta step it up a little bit and try. So how do we get these people? Okay, I can put up a splash page. I can put up an access point that says Hyatt. What that is is called a hotspot attack. Hotspot attack is very specifically, I pick a known hotspot name, possibly based on where I'm at, possibly based on just the fact that every phone in the world is configured to connect to ATT Wi-Fi for some strange reason. I pick something out of the blue, I run it up the flag, and I hope that somebody decides to connect to me. Unfortunately, that, that only is gonna work for a certain percentage, right? I mean, some of you are never going to connect to the Hyatt Wi-Fi because well, because they told you I was at the conference, you probably would have otherwise, but some people don't use those kinds of networks. Or maybe, you know, you're configured for H honors and you never actually feel like trying to connect. So I'm not gonna pick up 100% of people like this, which means it's not cool, right? So Hotspotter was the attack that came out after that. And what Hotspotter does is it scans the airspace, it looks for, I think it was 13 pre-configured SSIDs, to see what people were looking for, and then it brought up the most popular one. So rather than bringing up something I think you'll like, I take a basic poll of the users, and I say, what's everybody want? OK, I'll be that. So significantly more effective, instead of just randomly pulling something out of thin air, I'm, I'm using a, basically a user poll to see what they all want. And that's really cool. But again, that's only going to get 
the people who wanted the, the most requested SSID, the rest of them are gonna have to manually do it or you know, they just won't get connected to it. So Karma came out. The Karma attack is a very elegant attack. What it does is it simply responds to probe requests using the same name that you requested. That's the whole thing. So when you walk into a room and you say, hey John, but you don't actually know who John is. When the guy responds and says, oh, hey man, what's up? Is that John? Well, he responded when you said John, so he must be John, right? That's the way names work. It's the same with the access points. You scream 10 times a second, I'm looking for ATT Wi-Fi, and I respond, oh, I'm ATT Wi-Fi. I must be ATT Wi-Fi. But then the next guy will say, oh, I'm looking for Panera Bread. Oh, dude, I'm Panera Bread too. Oh, you, you wanted Starbucks? I'm, I'm Starbucks. And you just simply respond to all the names very rapidly. It ends up collecting quite literally every client that is looking for an open network and any Apple device because they will connect despite the lack of encryption, even if they're configured to only connect to encrypted access points. I know that sounds like I made it up and I wish I had, but no, it was tested on stage two days ago, and I actually found that at a government trade show by accident, and we won't go into details on that. Uh, so this is what the original Karma tool looked like. Uh, basically, this would sniff out, so here's the MAC address of the client. He's looking for a broadcast SSID, which is just I'm looking for anything, and then he's looking for all these different things by name, okay? The reason you look for things by name is because Originally in the standard, there was no such thing as hiding SSIDs. There's no non-broadcast SSIDs, none of that stuff was in the spec, and it's still not. So the issue is, is when people do stupid things like that, where they hide the identity of the access point, they force the onus onto the client to constantly, everywhere they go, scream out, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for this, I'm looking for this and it makes them a target because the client has no meaningful way of authenticating to something, right? The access points have all kinds of infrastructure, back end to verify the client is who they say they are, but the clients have very little ability to authenticate the access points typically. Uh, Bi-directional .1x authentication aside, uh, very few people are set up to properly authenticate the access points. That's what makes the clients so vulnerable. So originally, if you didn't hide your SSID, the clients wouldn't need to do this, but because they started going with this non-standard stuff, they started making the client supplicants probe by name, which made them very, very vulnerable. Uh, in newer versions of software, again, except for Apple, uh, you don't probe by name unless you absolutely have to probe by name because you know it's a hidden network. Uh, again, Apple wants to make sure that their users always have a good connection, so they're gonna probe by name no matter what, making them my single favorite target. So trusted network leakage, you can go into a place like this, you can fire up a basic sniffer. This is a screenshot of uh, apparently my laptop smoking. Oh no, that's an Apple, that's not mine, thank God. Uh, so somebody's laptop on there is smoking, it's some pretty sweet hack, nah, that's good stock photo, right? Uh, so you've got a screenshot from AeroDump NG, which is just a basic packet sniffer, and it's gonna show a list of all the clients and what networks they're probing for. This is actually what you use when instead of running a all out attack on anything you can possibly find, a crime of opportunity, I can sit there and bide my time waiting for the guy from Northrop Grumman or the guy from whatever my target is, right? You pick a nice, juicy company and you go to the coffee shop down the street where you know half of them are gonna stop on their way to, from, or at lunch, and you just sit down, you wait, oh, you're looking for your work network, let me provide that to you. Okay, other personal favorite, the smoking area. Okay, you set up this kind of attack from a cell phone, you hang out in the smoking area, especially of places that are no Wi-Fi. What's the first thing that a guy does after sparking up when he goes to the smoking area? Turns his cell phone on, starts connecting to stuff, checks his Facebook status. I mean, that's half the reason these guys smoke, right? Is because if they didn't smoke, they wouldn't have a reason to check Facebook 17 times a day. Oh, um, not a reason, an excuse, definitely excuse. There is no valid reason to check Facebook at all, but. 
So what Karma does <laughs> is after it scans, gets you connected, it's gonna run a series of fake services. So in this case, it's showing uh, access point service, DNS, and DHCP, okay? Uh, I normally do this kind of presentation at Muggle conferences, and I explain what DHCP and DNS are. Um, guessing from the looks on the audience face, I can skip that. You all understand what DHCP and DNS are? Now, do you all understand what it means that I have full control over DHCP and DNS. That means I pick your IP address. That's not too big a deal. I pick your gateway. I know your router. I am your router. And then I have full control over DNS. So when you ask for Microsoft.com, I'm gonna give you Linux.com because maybe you could learn something that day. Or I could redirect every single website to me and I could broker you back to the real one while modifying the pages in flight as I see fit. Whatever I wanna do, if you are the controlling point of the internet for that client, you can literally do anything. You can change the pages in transit, you can rewrite things completely, you can redirect people randomly. Uh, personal favorite, uh, Josh Wright was actually nice enough recently, I, th I think uh, last week, to release a I love my neighbor's virtual machine. And what it does is it runs a hotspot that will monkey with all of the websites. So you can set it to randomly add code. You can set it to uh, change pictures upside down. You can set it to take a picture of the web page and then make it all fuzzy and then present the picture of the web page back to the user. So you can actually make it fuzzy internet or upside down internet, or just put Rick rules across all of the pictures on the website. You know, whatever you want just to really have some fun. So that, that, that's my, my new personal favorite of entertaining things to do. Uh, his, his website is uh, Will Hack for Sushi. So if any of you want to actually go mess with that, I totally recommend it. Uh, so you know, this is just, uh, in addition to running the DHCP, DNS, now we can run all kinds of unauthenticated services or services that are not uh, securely authenticated, a POP3 server, an FTP server, an SMTP server. We can catch you checking your emails over insecure protocols, try to force you down to just sending me your clear text usernames and passwords. And that really saves just, just a boatload of time, to be honest. I mean, cracking passwords is just so uncool. Uh, so we've got a DNS request from my secret website and then an FTP request for username and password and bad things happen from there. Uh, you can also run a fake web server so that instead of giving you any realistic internet, I can just start running Internet Explorer exploits or what have you. <clears throat> but again, all this stuff just isn't that cool because, I mean, what happens if you're already connected to something when I show up? I mean, you might hold your connection to that like it was your last your, your last chance at survival, that's what Broadcom devices do, is they'll hold on to a network forever, and they'll never move over until something bad happens. We all know how client mobility roaming is. Some of the clients behave really well, and some of them are horrific. So maybe we could coax them a little bit and convince them that they really want to connect to me, right? So what we do is we started with AirJack. AirJack was a series of tools. It was a custom set of drivers for one wireless card under Linux, <clears throat> and it could run a de-authenticate attack. Okay, management frames, until very recently, and still only if you're using 802.11w, which nobody is, uh, management frames are completely unauthenticated, so you can just kind of spit them out into the air and people get them. So I can send a packet saying, you are de-authenticated from the network, please reconnect, and it knocks you off the AP. Uh, really cool attack, uh, really limited usage because it's custom drivers and it's difficult and Linux and blah, blah, blah. Uh, Void 11 is a tool that came out afterwards that used the standard drivers for one of the Wi-Fi cards, uh, basically abused some, some of the driver features for being an access point, and just caused it to de-authenticate everything in sight. Uh, worked really well, also supported authentication and association attacks, but again, this is one wireless card, this is a special you know, driver. Uh, then MDK2 came out, and then later MDK3. It was raw packet transmission, it was just I'm gonna send out packet, here's my packet, and the cards just do it. Uh, this was brought about because the newer Wi-Fi cards were able to do things like this that the older Wi-Fi cards couldn't. So this could do beacon flooding mode. So those of you who were here the first day and were opening your phones and seeing funny SSIDs and things like that, yeah, I get bored a lot. Um, authentication DOS mode. Uh, those of you who noticed that the pineapples stopped working after a few minutes, <laughs> yeah, I get bored a lot. Uh, basic probing mode, uh, if you notice that your pineapple slows to an absolute crawl because it's servicing 5,000 clients, 
yeah, I can probe flood you too, that's kind of funny. And then a muck mode, which is a de-authenticate everything in site mode. Uh, basically from, I don't know, a cell phone, you could take the Wi-Fi for this entire conference area down, no problem with a tool like this. Can send 500 de-authenticate frames a second, so I can knock everybody here off three times a second, and that's pretty much the end of your usage of the Wi-Fi network. So this is a little picture of MDK2, just to show how far these tools have come. Got a nice little help, tells you how to use it. Oh, here, run this command. Oh, you want this flag. Uh, the newer versions are actually even nicer. They support things like blacklists and whitelists, so I can knock you off of every AP, except mine. All of a sudden, I have the only functional access point in the airspace. What do you think that does for my client collection rate? Helps a little bit, just a little. Uh, so this runs on Linux. It was successfully ported to a couple other operating systems, but you need proprietary hardware to do raw packet transmission in Windows and things like that. So it's limited usefulness outside of Linux, but popular live CDs bundle this stuff. You can just download it, run MDK3, and do awful things, very awful things. Uh, the one warning I will give is if you are interested in this kind of stuff and you want to play with it, be super careful. Hacker tools aren't exactly known for their discretion. It is really, really hard to operate tools like this without DOSing literally everything within range. Um, until you get the hang of it, I recommend doing this somewhere where you're not going to be pissing off all of your neighbors because they will notice and they will get upset. I took out an 11 story building once because they said I couldn't, so I did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, they shouldn't have had the meeting on the fifth floor. I mean, I was in the middle. It was too easy, right? Yeah, th these, these are nasty. Normally, when I'm doing testing, I'll actually get an 8011A wireless card and an 8011A access point so that I'm off in the 5 gigahertz, which, as everybody has said, 2.4 gigahertz is dead, but it's also the only thing anybody ever uses. So 5 gigahertz will at least keep you from messing up all of your neighbors, or you'll force them back down into 2.4, but they won't even notice. Demo, yay. Slides suck, don't they? Necessary. Yeah, oh, no, uh, I, no, slides are just awful. Okay, so yesterday <clears throat> I did an awful lot of demos and uh, most of them actually worked for my favor. So today we're gonna be super ballsy and see if we can do the opposite of what I did yesterday. So yesterday I used a cell phone to hack my Target laptop and today I'm going to use my laptop to hack a Target cell phone. So we'll just kind of bring that full circle and see what we can do. So uh, those of you who remember from yesterday that I've got a little tool I call Metasploit Flashbang. Metasploit is a collection of exploits, Metasploit, that are used by the pen testing, the hacking communities to test stuff. Uh, so basically on Microsoft Patch Tuesday, they come out with the patches to everything. Uh, the kind folks at Metasploit reverse engineer them. And then they have Metasploit Wednesday where they release everything as fast as humanly possible so you can test to see if everybody patched in that 24 hour window you gave them. All right, I'm not giving those guys enough credit. They're normally like closer to eight hours than 24. So, <laughs> bad news. Um, so basically all this does is it runs Metasploit and it runs a quick loader file so that I don't have to type a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, in this case, the attack is a bit more manual than before. Uh, this one is only going to load one specific exploit. In this case, it is Android Browser Web View Add JavaScript Interface Exploit. It's an exploit against the Android SDK, which is important, I'll get to why in a second. And then it's gonna give the information for where my computer is so that it can call back to me and, and reconnect once it attacks the device successfully. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to attack here is an Android cell phone that in this case is running Android 4.04 ice cream sandwich uh, no, I'm sorry, that's not Ice Cream Sandwich, that's whatever 4.0 is, I don't even remember anymore, there's so many names. Uh, so this is 4.04. Uh, the interesting thing about that is that this specific exploit actually uh, 
is patched in 4.04. Uh, Android 4.04 is immune to the attack that I'm about to run. The problem is, is that it's not just a bug in Android, it's a bug in the SDK that they give you to build other software on. Because it's in the SDK, every app that is built against the vulnerable version of the SDK is still vulnerable. So, if you build against an old SDK, your stuff on the Play Store for Android 4.4 or 5.0 or whatever, if you're building with the old vulnerable SDK, your brand new app is going to bring those vulnerabilities back in time right to the present and you can still use them. Uh, in this case, to get around the fact that the Android version is not vulnerable, I'm using a third party browser. Uh, I, wish, I wish that I had a, a witty story for this, but this is how I found this browser. Uh, this is my wife's old cell phone, and she installed this browser, and it was already there. That is how I found this browser. Uh, it's called Maxthon. It was installed because it's super fast. That's, that's their thing. Uh, it's super fast and made in China. Huh. Wait a minute. China. So they're probably stealing all of my personal information. Why does the browser need access to the camera? Never mind, we'll get to that in a minute, I'm sure. So uh, what I'm gonna do here real quick is I'm just going to open up the browser on this cell phone, and if I am lucky, I can point it to my website here. Do, 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 do. Could you take this for a minute? That'd be really helpful. Oh, you're such a kind soul. Gonna burn my hands or something? Uh, here, let me get that back for a second, actually. My session died. Apparently, you have uh, one of those grips that just completely covers the antenna. <laughs> Not this specific attack. Uh, iPhones are not, yeah, iPhones are not vulnerable to this specific attack because this is the Android browser exploit. Uh, there are other attacks that, uh, that Apple would be vulnerable to as well. So we're gonna go interactive with the session that we've got on that phone. And we're going to see what's going on. We've got, hey, I said help. Are you dead again? Can you hit refresh on that browser? It's a little circle-y thing that looks like refresh. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Why are you not holding your session? Yeah, I'll just take that back if you don't mind. Yeah, probably crashed the browser. <laughs> Do, do, do. Yeah, the, the one negative of using real exploits on stage is that sometimes it crashes just a little bit harder than you wanted it to crash. You want it to crash and give you remote code execution, but you know, darn it, if you destabilize the whole thing, that just doesn't work. You're really gonna be like that. This demo almost never works when it's live. It always works 10 minutes before it's live, which is, you know how that goes. Don't you hold your bloody connection. All right, has anybody ever seen a hacker dance for as long as it takes for a phone to reboot? Nah, I still have like 15 minutes anyway, so we'll give this guy a second to reboot and hopefully it'll be funny when I'm done. Better it won't be.
One of those two things will definitely happen, though. I can repeat it too. Oh, okay. Uh, does the changing of website does the changing of websites have a name or something like that? That attack, uh, um, like why fishing? You know, is a snappy name. I, I yeah. I just didn't know if it had a name or something. It, it is always way cooler to release your exploits after it's got its own awesome logo and name and whatnot. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is some of this stuff is just so simple that there's not really a lot of name associated with it. Uh, when I control your whole internet connection, I'm passing you the packets for that website, so to just inject code into there, I mean, that, that's really the, the closest to a name you've got, is it's, it's code injection, HTML injection. Um, the other term, depending on how you're using it, is called cache poisoning. So for instance, when you log into the hotel here, you have to be on an unencrypted network for a few seconds just to go to that first splash page, just to type in that password, then you can fire up your VPN and be totally secure, right? So what you can actually do in the meantime is when the user first hits that page, you can do some cache poisoning where basically I'll say, okay, I need you to cache the Google Analytics JavaScript file, and I need that cache to expire in 900 years and my JavaScript file is going to be a backdoor that opens up a connection to my machine no matter where you are. So now you'll fire up your VPN, and the next website you go to that calls for the Google Analytics JavaScript file will load my backdoor on your system, and you'll immediately call back to me. So you'll be at the hotel, you'll be on your VPN, you'll be 100% secure in your mind with the backdoor going right out to the attacker. Does that mean when we connect at a hotel, you'd recommend clearing your cache before you fire up the VPN? When you connect at a hotel or any public venue, my recommendation is, is if you cannot turn on your VPN first, you shouldn't be on the network. Because honestly, I cannot think of a way to keep you secure otherwise. Uh, at Pony Express, we've done some, some really entertaining just sniffing of networks. And we found that the second devices connect, there's a flood of things that come out of them. And you're never going to get all of those caches cleared, all of those things secured. I mean, Twitter, Facebook, your weather app on your phone, all of these things immediately start calling out the second they get a connection. Now, theoretically, they're going to get blocked by the splash page. Unless, of course, you're on my network, in which case, well, I might not connect you to Twitter, but I'll connect you to something, right? So there's so many avenues for attack that realistically, if you can't have that VPN open the second you connect, it's, it's pretty iffy. And if you connect me to something that's not Twitter, will I see that in the address bar? No, because I control what you think DNS is, so I can make it look like Twitter, I can make it respond like Twitter, and it'll be whatever I want it to be. Got it. So the address will say twitter.com. Yeah. The only thing you cannot easily do, I, I say easily for a reason, it can be done, but you cannot easily do HTTPS like that okay. because my, ser my, my thing has to be signed and say I am twitter.com or whatever. Uh, a lot of browsers don't validate properly, so you can actually get evilhackerdomain.com signed by RSA and then use that one to sign randomintermediatecertificate.com and then use that one to sign twitter.com and they'll say, oh, this is a twitter.com certificate and oh, it's signed by RSA, totally legit. So I mean like really, really stupid attacks like that actually do work sometimes, but it's, it's iffy as to you know, browser specific and that kind of thing. Thank you. Yep. All right, let's see if this guy is any happier or less happy with me. And that's why you don't update your boxes before you give a demo. The exploit side or the phone side? <laughs> the exploit side, unfortunately. Uh, I had to do some special custom magic yesterday for my demo because Metasploit had changed some things. 
And apparently I thought they were done and the answer to that is no sir, they are not. So they changed a few more things yesterday when I was trying to fix stuff. So that's cool. But yeah, so uh, that's not gonna fly and I'm not gonna get to show that and I am sorry. But to explain what is possible, um, Android in specific uh, is very good at application sandboxing. So when you go to the Play Store to install something and it says, would you like to give the app these permissions? Those are the things that the app has access to and it does not have access to other things. Okay? Barring a secondary exploit, if I take over the browser, I have all of the permissions the browser had and nothing more. Okay? So what happens is, is the stock browser has the ability to read and write from the SD card, which is basically the main memory on an Android device. So I can read and write all of your personal files, I can download all of your pictures, I can see your contacts, things like that can be pulled in a raw form off of the device. If the app has permissions to read email, read contacts, read call log, and things like that, Metasploit actually has a nice built-in for that where it will say, dump call log, dump SMS, and it will just download all of those things from the database in a nicely formatted way for you. Assuming the application has the permission, it's literally using the Android API calls to say, well, I have permission to read the contact list, give me the contact list. Incidentally, that's the same reason why you didn't have to pay for that app, because that's exactly what the app developers are doing, is they're scraping all of your info and they're selling it to somebody. Which is, incidentally, why Google has to have such good spam filtering, because their whole business model is built on selling your personal information, and I didn't say that. Uh, you get the idea, right? So the sandboxing works really, really well on there, so there's, there's that to look at, so you can at least say if the app doesn't have this permission, it can't do it. It also says that when you see the app with the huge stack of permissions, maybe you don't want to install that app. I know that I have skipped a few. Uh, who here uses Open Cell Tracker? Uh, that really cool app that uh, a couple of guys that are here all the time are raving about. It tells you how good your cell phone reception is and where the nearest tower is and all that stuff. And the permissions on the app allow it to reroute your email, reroute your SMS, and reroute all of your calls. Well, it's really easy to tell me how good my signal quality is if you route all of it through China and tell me how good it is, right? That's how a lot of that stuff works. And I know personally, I, I'm not rerouting all of my calls through China. It just didn't seem like a good idea at the time. All right, so I'm gonna give this guy one more shot before I explain the part of the demo I was actually trying to give. Yeah, they killed the Android interpreter. So the, the last thing is, is this browser, again, I, I wish I hadn't found it by accident so I had a cool story, but literally it was just pre-installed on the phone. Uh, this browser has access to the camera for God knows what possible reason it has access to the camera. Uh, not just access to the front camera, but access to the back camera too. So as you know, most phones have a front facing and a rear facing camera. So I can actually take a snapshot off of both cameras on this device typically. Uh, not just that, there's a mode in Metasploit called webcam stream, where it will stream a constant video out of the camera. Uh, I normally am one of those guys from about five years ago when it was cool who likes to have the sweet belt clip that holds it off the pocket or the belt so that my phone's always there and it's not taking up valuable pocket space because I'm a nerd. I have a lot of stuff in my pockets. Just, you know, think the rest of you are the same way. Half of you have backpacks, so. The best thing about that is when you take over somebody's phone and something like that, they're basically a walking bug through whatever facility that you're in. As long as you can stay within Wi-Fi range, you can do that. Um, the negative to that is that newer phones have really, really nice cameras typically. Okay, they're not really nice, but they have a lot of megapixels. So you get like a 16 megapixel camera doing a stream and it's going to be a very big amount of bandwidth. Uh, you can take the snapshots instead or older phones like this have a, a lower resolution camera so they can do full motion video streaming a little bit better. Uh, even at a distance. So normally this would work all the way to the back of the room where you could do a full webcam streamcast of, of everything from the phone right up to the, the stage. 
Unfortunately, it's not gonna happen, so I apologize. There is a video of me doing that online. If you don't believe me, it is actually possible, and uh, hopefully I'll get this working later. But that's about all I have for today, so we'll take any questions from everybody. And as usual, people were kind enough to blurt out their questions when they were appropriately timed. So uh, if you all want to chat later, I will be around. I've also got some stickers from yesterday that you people didn't take. So if anybody wants stickers, I've got stickers and I don't want to take them home. So have a great day and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for coming.